grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, grant us your Holy Spirit that we may hear the truth of your word, experience the presence of Jesus, and rejoice in our forgiveness and life. In the precious name of our Savior we pray. Amen. Chosen. So this probably won't surprise any of you. When I was growing up, I was kind of a dork, a nerd. I really was. I was the fat chubby guy who was in band, I didn't play sports, I was a band geek. And I remember all too well what that was like. The day that gym class came and it was time to choose teams. Or the day that we play sports in the neighborhood. And I'll be honest with you, I can't play sports to save my life. Like, if I was playing football, I'd see one of those big guys running at me and I'd just give them the ball. That's, that's just me. I'm, I'm sorry. That's what I would do. And I remember that. I remember they're standing and waiting to be chosen. Pick me, pick me. Chosen to be on somebody's team. Chosen to be playing on the good side instead of being the robber in Cops and Robbers. Whatever it was, I remember being chosen. And there are two things I learned when that happened. Number one, it feels really good when you are chosen, even if you're the last person chosen. And number two, it really stinks when you're not chosen. <laughs> it really stinks. But here's the reality. As painful as that can be in our childhood experience, there's something far greater that happens. By virtue of baptism, by virtue of the power of the Holy Spirit, you are chosen. God has chosen you. Yes, that's right. God has chosen you. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He knit you together and you are wonderfully and fearfully made. He put you together with all your talents and abilities before you even saw the day of light as you grew with inside your mother's womb. He put you together and he knew you. He already knew you by name and God has chosen you. God has chosen you the day you were baptized when water was placed on your head with the words of Jesus Christ and God the Father. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God chose you as he wiped away all of your sins, past, present, and future. God chose you as he made you his child. God chose you as he redeemed you. God chose you as he gave you his victory. God chose you as he brought you in to his family and gave you a new name, God's child, holy and dearly loved. We know that God does this. We see it today when God meets Peter who begins to follow him. He gives him a new name. And God does this. He likes to give people new names. What well, your new name is, God's child. In fact, that is the core of your identity. As God's chosen people, you are special. You are more special than anything else in all creation. You are the crown of his creation, the pinnacle of everything he's done, and you are God's child. That is your identity. Identity is a big thing these days. The world tries to take it away. Satan with shame tries to take it away. The world tries to think that you are your job, or you're how well you work, or you're, you're defined by how good of a parent you are, or you're defined by your failures, your mistakes, your illness, your mental illness, or fill in the blank. This is absolutely, certainly a lie from the devil. Because your identity, because you are God's chosen people is God's child, holy and dearly loved. Now, I don't know about you, but I want you to think about that for a second. I want you to think about the weight, the good weight of this, what it means to be God's child. Bask in that for a second, that he loves you so much that in your sinfulness, in my sinfulness, he came down from heaven to save us. Now, I don't know about you, but it's true for me. I don't always live like a child of God. I don't always live like I'm one of God's chosen. I mean, it's so easy to fall into sin. It's so easy as temptation comes into our life to stumble and fall. I don't live as God's child when I, when I fail in not being Jesus, his witness to those around me. I don't live as God's child when I don't let his, let his love have its way with me. When I hold grudges, when I gossip, when I get mad, when I say things to people I shouldn't say, and yes, I do that. In fact, I confess to you, I did that this week. I got mad at my eye doctor's office and said some things on the phone I regret saying. But I'm a sinner, and we all do that, right? 
It's in these times when, when lust overtakes us, when um, uh, lying overtakes us, when um, we're, we're more apt to go out and, and to look better and act better in society than we really are. All of these things, when they overtake us, when we fail at being a good spouse, when we fail at being a good parent, all of these things, when they overtake us, we fail at being God's child in the world. We fail at acting as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. We do it all the time. But then there's Jesus. <laughs> the holy chosen one. The chosen above all the chosen. Beautiful Jesus. I don't know what God was thinking. I wish I could tell you that. I don't understand it. If you do, great. Talk to me afterwards. But I don't get it. I don't know what God was thinking when he looked down at us, poor, sinful people, and he said, I can't live without them. That's what he said. I can't live without them. They are my chosen people. I do not want to think about spending one day of eternity without my people. So he sends his beloved son, Jesus, into the world. I look at my life and I think, I don't deserve that. I don't. Because I am a poor, rotten sinner, and I stink. Well, not really. I took a shower today, but I stink. I do. But yet God, in his love, sent Jesus into this world, the holy chosen one, the chosen above all the chosen. He sent him down into the midst of our creation to live the life that we live, to be tempted, to be tried, to be tortured, to have the struggles that we live without sin so that Jesus might give us his perfection and righteousness. Now, that baffles my mind. Think about that. God loves you so much. You are his chosen one that he says, okay, they can't do it on their own, so I'm going to give them Jesus to do it for them. And then he gives us his righteousness. And then he says, but wait a minute, there's this punishment that they need to pay, but you know, I don't want to punish them because I love them. They're my chosen ones. They're my creation. So he sends Jesus to the cross to die for us, to take every shred of our punishment and death and hell on himself as he hung there, tortured and tried for us removing our punishment, removing the wrath of God, forgiving us and giving us eternal life. And then, then he sent him to the grave, to the grave. He sent Jesus to the grave. He was dead. But three days later, he rose again for you and for me to show us that the grave no longer holds us, that the grave is now a portal to our eternal victory in Jesus, that through death and the grave we enter with Jesus into eternal life with God. That's how much we mean to him. That's how much you mean to him. We are his chosen people. And because we are his chosen people, he has done everything in his power which is everything in giving us the chosen one above all chosen ones, Jesus Christ, to do everything humanly imaginable and beyond to rescue us from sin, death, and the devil and to bring us into his salvation now and for eternity. What an amazing God we have that he would deign to choose you and I over and over again since the beginning of creation in the salvation of Jesus, in holy baptism, through the power of his word, in the holy sacrament of the Lord's Supper. He chooses us over and over and over again, calling us child of God to rescue us from the pit of this life and to give us his glory and his grace and his mercy and his life for eternity. Indeed, you are chosen in Jesus Christ. You are chosen to glorify God. That's why God wanted us. That's why he created us. Because he didn't know how to live without somebody glorifying him. And God said, so I'm going to create these people so they worship me. So that I can be in relationship with them and love them and they'll worship and glorify me with a life of thanksgiving. He says you are chosen in Christ, chosen to be his hands and his mouth and feet in this world. This is the reality of what it means to be Christian. If we fail at being the hands, mouth, and feet of Jesus in the world, we are denying that we are God's chosen people. If we fail at spreading his gospel, which that's why we are called in baptism, that's what we are chosen to do is to spread the gospel, we fail at being the children of God. We are called and equipped and commissioned to be the presence of the love of Jesus everywhere we go. Think about that for a second. God's love is perfect, right? His love is so perfect that he's forgiven and redeemed and saved us. And now he says, by the way, I want you to be my love. That's kind of scary, but it's so exciting, isn't it? 
Think about how his love overcomes everything. His love shines in the darkness and it cannot be overcome. His love transforms human lives. His love will change the world and bring peace where there is no peace. You are called to be God's chosen people who have inherited the kingdom of God for all eternity. Yes, this is most certainly true. His kingdom, all his wealth, all his riches, all his beauty, all his glory, all his grace, all his everything now belongs to you. Yesterday, today, and forever, it all belongs to you. And so what happens as we rest in being God's chosen people? Our lives, our hearts, our minds, they change. Because we realize that no matter what Satan in this world throws at us, we have already overcome and been given the kingdom of heaven for eternity. And that changes us. It changes us to face life with happiness and peace and joy even in the midst of trial, tribulation, and struggles. Why? Because Jesus has given us the victory. Heaven is our home, now and forever. Amen.